This is Karen Launchball again at the University of Idaho uh, working on topics in the integrated rangeland management class. Previously we talked about what you need to know about plant morphology, specifically meristems and buds, and how they relate to a plant's ability to recover from disturbance such as grazing and fire. Now, there's another side to the story. Not only does the plant have morphological characteristics that assist it in recovering from disturbance and in growing, it also has physiological activity and abilities to recover from disturbance. So we're gonna go over those in this, dis in this uh, discussion. Let's start with photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is really important because that's how energy from the sun, of course, is captured and fuels all the ecosystem processes on rangelands. Again, simply, it's just carbon dioxide and water which are um, gathered by the plant along with energy from the sun, which is absorbed with uh, chlorophyll, creating a carbon-based energy, sugar compound, and oxygen. Let's focus on that energy, that sugar. Let's first distinguish between structural and non-structural carbohydrates. Non-structural carbohydrates are those like sugars and starches. They're soluble, they're soluble in water, they're highly available, they're easy to break down, uh, it is sugars that the plant uses and transports in its uh, inside itself to create the energy for growth. It's the compounds that we as mammals are able to digest, sugars and starches, easily. Digest them for energy. Uh, many animals in the environment also can use these starches and, and, uh, and sugars as energy sources. Uh, distinguishing also starches, what the plant uses to store energy in the roots, and that will come up a little bit later. So let's distinguish those highly available soluble energy sources from structural carbohydrates. I abbreviate CHOs as carbohydrates, so whenever you see that, just think carbohydrates. Structural carbohydrates in the plant are mostly cell walls. So once a cell wall is, is formed, it's not easy to break down and turn back into energy. We mammals, we can't do that. Once it forms that cellulose compound or hemicellulose or other compounds in the cell wall, we can't break it down. Um, it's not water soluble and the, the um, critters in the environment that can break it down are mostly fungi and uh, bacteria, so they're microbes. So again, distinguish between highly available non-structural carbohydrates and structural carbohydrates, but that once structural carbohydrates are formed, they are difficult to turn back into energy. So let's take a closer look at those energy compounds or those products of phot photosynthesis. First, the non-structural or soluble carbohydrates. Uh, they are um, good sources of immediate energy for both plants and animals. Sucrose is the major form of carbohydrate that is transported in the plant. So that's uh, an important sugar in the plant that um, is transported to provide energy for the plant. Starch is the major form of soluble carbohydrate that is stored, such as in the roots of the plant. Structural carbohydrates, uh, once they're made, remember that they cannot uh, be used as energy for plants or animals unless that mammal has a symbiotic relationship with microbes in their rumen, such as deer and elk and cows and sheep have, the ruminant animals, or animals that have a, a relationship with um, microbes in their hindgut, such as horses and rabbits. Then they can use, then the, those microbes can break down cellulose and structural carbohydrates and uh, create an energy source uh, usable by the animal. Cellulose is the most important structural carbohydrate in plant. That's sort of the basis of those cell walls. It's also the most abundant carbohydrate on earth. So it, it's one that we need to learn a lot about. On the right hand there, there's a diagram. Uh, cellulose is, remember, it's just units of glucose. So glucose is a highly soluble sugar, but they're bound together by what are called 1,4 bonds. So the carbon at the position one and four um, are bound in, in a way that makes that, cell, that glucose indigestible and turns it into these long strands of cellulose. On the other side of the coin, let's talk about respiration. So respiration is when you take those soluble carbon compounds, those soluble sugars, add some oxygen to them, and you create carbon dioxide and water and energy for the plant, but also for the animal. Respiration in the plant is the same as for us. We take sugars and we turn them into energy. Plants do that. What do they use energy for? Well, first they use it for what we call assimilation, to synthesize compounds such as proteins and carbohydrates, to get minerals out of the soil, uptake minerals and water, active transport of minerals and sugars 
um, throughout the, the plant body. Those are all activities of simulation. So that's just the everyday growth of the, of the plant. There's also quite a lot of energy needed for maintenance to um, respiration for those living tissue, the action of the cells, and then also respiration during uh, dormancy. So I'm going to just kind of com uh, compare and contrast growth or a simulation versus maintenance, which is just keeping the plant alive. Let's look a little more closely about at that assimilation part. What is energy used for? Think about vegetative growth, such as revegetating leaves, stems, roots. Uh, also, anytime after dormancy, there would be bud formation, regrowth after fire, mowing, and, and uh, grazing. All of those require energy. Reproductive growth is also important as the plant starts to elevate that apical meristem and produce flowers and seeds. Those would all be things that a plant needs energy for. If you're managing plants in the ecosystem, you have to pay attention to how much plants, how much energy is needed by the plant and make sure it has that energy to go through its life cycle. So what affects photosynthesis and respiration? Well, first of all, how old is that leaf? Uh, young leaves are, um, they're more photosynthetically if active. Also, how much leaf area is there? So those are both characteristics that determine how uh, much photosynthesis, how effective the plant is at photosynthesis, and how much it respires. Light quality can affect photosynthesis. The temperature of the air and the soil affect the rate of photosynthesis. Soil moisture um, content, moisture in the system also affects photosynthesis. Soil nutrient levels, carbon dioxide levels, and then efficiency of photosynthetic transport. Some plants are just better at different ages and types of plants are better at transporting photosynthate throughout its system. How might grazing and fire alter these photosynthetic activities? Because we don't have a lot of control over those uh, things like light and carbon dioxide in the air and, and soil and heat, but we do have control over fire and grazing to some extent. First of all, fire and grazing remove photosynthetic material so that is a disadvantage of the plant because that photosynthetic synthetic tissue is how the plant creates its energy. Um, we could also remove meristems. And remember from a previous lecture, it's really important to pay attention to whether meristems are uh, in the plant and if available for recovery. Another thing we do is we change the live dead ratio of, um, of the plant, especially cows, they, cattle and sheep and goats, grazing animals. They are looking for live material and they may focus on live and then leave a, a higher ratio of dead. And we know that old dead material is not very photosynthetically active. There's also some mechanical impacts such as trampling of the soil, breaking branches, removing leaves. Those are important um, effects of grazing. And in the case of fire, there's also a heat effect. Um, he can kill leaves and stems. We'll talk about that in terms of exactly how much heat it takes. And then they can damage meristems. So the heat effect depends on the how the heat of the plant or the heat of the fire and the type of plant. Now I'm going to take you back into uh, trying to understand carbohydrate reserves. Remember, our job as managers is to think about what plant how how much energy plants are needing and, and whether they have that ability to recover. So there is an important concept where we, we're going to talk about carbon gain. And carbon gain is the amount of leaf area plus the photosynthetic rate. And uh, first of all, when the, the plant is going along photosynthesizing, there, there's this idea that if you remove some of the photosynthetic material, the remaining photosynthetic material might increase. And it can increase up to 15% in some plants. And so that is called compensatory photosynthesis. So the plants are, are humming along, they're photosynthesizing. If an animal comes along and removes, grazes off some of those leaves, the remaining leaves could increase their photosynthetic rate up to 15%. Some plants do it better than others. That's called compensatory photosynthesis. Here's an example of compensatory photosynthesis in a grass. Uh, this is a case where we're on the, the Y margin. We're looking at carbon exchange, which is a, an example. It, it's a, a measure of photosynthetic activity. And the top plant is the plant that was clipped daily. So in a 10-day trial, that plant was clipped every day or f frequently throughout the trial. And you look at that photosynthetic rate. It stays about the same of that plant leaf structure throughout the trial. 
But the plant that was not clipped gets a little, as it ages, even within 10 days, we start to see a drop in photosynthetic rate. So this compensatory photosynthesis is the difference between the plant that, that reduced its photosynthetic rate as it got older versus a plant that maintained high photosynthetic rate as it was, even when it was clipped. The, there's a theory called carbohydrate reserve theory, and that's important because carbohydrate reserves are what allow the plant to recover from defoliation. In the historic view that we believe that carbohydrate reserves were very important, that we had to pay attention to how many reserves the plant had, what was that pool of carbohydrate reserves the plant had for recovery from fire or grazing. The contemporary view focuses much more on the current conditions and the leaf material because in this modern view, we believe that it's the, the plant's ongoing um, photosynthesis that creates energy for recovery. Those are pretty contrasting views. I'm going to show you the, the pre historic and the contemporary views so that you can compare and contrast those. Okay, so here's that historic view. And up until about the 1980s, this is what we believed happened. I bring this up and I show this graph that because even though it's wrong, it shows up a lot in literature. So when you see this, think twice. So what's happening here is that the plant is um, photos is using um, carbon. So that, that area below the zero, when it's red there, that means that it's using food, in this case starch, so it's using food that's stored in the roots. So November, December, January, February, March, the plant is just dormant. So it's using a little bit of energy every day to just maintain itself. And then it starts rapid growth in March, April, May that uh, the roots and start to grow down and, this, and the top, top of the plant starts to grow. So there's this period of top growth early, slow and fast early in the spring. And so the, during that time, it was believed that the, the plant was pulling up all those starches in their roots. And, and that was what was fueling the growth for about three months until you finally got to June or July when the plant was putting up its seed stock and it started to slow down. And then it started putting store, food back into storage, so that green part of the line, and started filling up the roots uh, the starch in the roots in July, August, September. So it was believed by this that the time you could really damage a plant was when it was really using a lot of energy, that fast growth time, right about when you hit seed stock, the plant was finally starting to slow down and finally starting to put um, energy back into the roots. So that point where we start to get green is when it would start to be safe to, to graze the plant because it, it had quit using a lot of energy for the year. So that would be June or July. So that was the kind of the idea here was that you had to let the plant start to start start to begin storing carbon again before it was safe to disturb it or especially graze it. So the premise of this um, of, of plant management with this theory was that the carbohydrate reserve level and they measured starch in the roots was synonymous with plant vigor and the ability to, of the plant to survive grazing and drought. So it was important for managers to track this level of carbohydrates in the roots, and that would tell us uh, whether the plant was able to survive a disturbance. So the management implications here were that if we believed in this theory, the timing of defoliation was really important. We had to wait until the plant really started putting energy back into those roots and that the rest time after defoliation was key to have proper grazing management. So the, the idea was that energy was coming in at sort of a steady rate and we had to wait until the, the carbohydrate reserves were in a, a positive carbon balance. There was more going in than coming out. Uh, this might be like our savings account theory. We, you, someone might look at our savings account and try to say whether we were able to handle a, dis, a disturbance. Assuming that uh, money is going into our savings account at a regular rate, that we might be able to handle some disturbance if we have enough money in our savings account, and that it's going to take some rest time after that defoliation to keep the money going into the savings account. There was one problem with this approach and that was that scientists measured the concentration the percent of structural of soluble carbohydrates in the root material they didn't measure the total amount so um, it's the total amount of energy that the animal that the plant has to recover not the percent of carbon in the roots 
In the 1980s, a few studies were published that helped us kind of rethink that historic view and replace it with what I'll call the contemporary view. In this more modern view, resources for recovery depend on energy well beyond just stored uh, energy in the roots. So some scientists challenged the view that carbohydrate reserves in the roots were a major reservoir of energy used for plant regrowth. These scientists measured a little bit different. They measured the carbohydrate pools, not the concentration. They measured the concentration plus the biomass of, uh, of area in the root and in the stem and the leaves that could be used to produce uh, carbohydrates. So they came up with this new idea of the total non-structural carbohydrates, TNC. What's the total amount of energy available for the plant to grow? And they found that the pools of carbohydrates were um, increasing early in the season. So you might remember from that previous grass, it looked like car concentration was going down, but because mass was going up, the total amount of carbohydrates, the pool of carbohydrates was greater. Here's how that looks um, on the ground in a study that was done on some plants in the plains. If you look at total non-structural carbohydrates of blue grama, for example, you'll see that um, that TNC level, that black line, um, if the plant is grazed early before, right when it initially starts, that amount of total non-structural carbohydrate, go, is go, it goes down. Um, as the plant starts to, uh, it, you know, put leaves on, so that's two leaf. And then at four leaf, you'll see that there's more energy coming in, that's the top line herbage yield, than there is um, going out, that TNC line going down. And then by the time you get to five leaves, and the boot stage, then the plant is in a total, it's a positive carbohydrate a balance because that the leaf, the total non-structural carbohydrates are going up. So it happens really quickly within just a couple of leaves when more energy starts coming in than is going out. If you add a defoliation event such as at the five leaf stage, um, thinking that a plant might make it to seven or eight leaves before it um, produces seeds, if you add a defoliation kind of early in its life cycle, then the total non-structural carbohydrates go down. The plant starts to use those carbohydrates, but then it starts to put on herbage yield again, and it gets back into a carbon balance in just a, a short time. Uh, this is blue bunch wheatgrass, similar uh, graph. Early in the spring on the top, the total non-structural carbohydrates goes down. Herbage yield goes up. By the time you get to three or four leaves, the plant is in a positive carbon balance. If you defoliate the plant at the five leaf stage, TNC goes down, the, the stored carbohydrates goes down, but pretty quickly the plant starts to grow more leaves and gets back in a carbon balance. I think the take home message here is that it's not this big gas tank that is getting slowly drained and slowly um, uh, filled up again with carbohydrates. It's just a small amount. The plant uses a, a small amount of energy to get started in the spring, and, and once it gets uh, two or three leaves, it's in a positive carbon balance. If you graze the plant somewhere in there, especially early on, it just takes a few days for the plant to get back into a carbon, um, a carbon benefit situation. So the management implications of this more contemporary theory that is, is that it's more important to manage the intensity of defoliation. Because most of the energy is coming from those leaves that are photosynthesizing, it's important to, to not defoliate them too much. In other words, to manage the percent of those leaves that are removed, because that's where most of the energy comes from. So carbohydrate, reserve, carbohydrate reserves, especially in the roots and the stems, are less important than once believed. They're just a part of a complex process. The, C, the carbohydrates are a battery to jumpstart defoliation in the spring. They're not a big gas tank for sustained energy. When growing conditions are good, such as in the spring, defoliation is not as detrimental because the plant has everything it needs to regrow, and most of the energy is coming from photosynthesis, not stored reserves. So it's, it's not a complete opposite of the historic view. It's just a, a twinkie, tweaking saying that we really got to pay more attention to energy that's coming into the plant in the form of actively growing leaves. So that's the bottom line. <clears throat> The, uh, again, we're going to start talking later in the class about when the plants are susceptible to grazing and fire, but remember the plants do need some carbon 
uh, remember different forms of carbon and how plants might differ in their ability to use those carbon sources.